Um, so praise the Lord. We're all set. Let's get right into the word here. Anybody have any questions on fear? Anything at all? It can be paralyzing. <laughs> it can be paralyzing, yeah. You know, sometimes it was interesting. It's just like yesterday. I, I, um, I, I'm so blessed that I got a chance to minister to that family and to talk to that gentleman. But I have to say that everything within my flesh was trying to find any other excuse to just do something else. And, you know, I want you to know it wasn't that my heart wasn't in a good place, but those are uncomfortable situations. You don't, you don't know what you're walking into and how receptive people will be. Um, I can actually remember uh, praying for Sean's grandfather, and the family in the other room were ready to escort me out because he was receiving Jesus. So there could be interesting times in your life where fear will try and cripple or, or stop you from what you're doing. And I had to just continue to drive up the laneway yesterday. I had to continue to drive up and park behind the cars and walk up to the door and knock on the door, and they let you in, and they were very receptive, and it was fine. But the enemy will sometimes use things to sort of stop you and say, don't do this. Don't do this. And you'll have eight different reasons. It's time to rotate the tires in your car or something. But sometimes, you, you know, Joyce Meyer says it, but you've got to do it afraid. Now, I'm not talking about inviting fear, but there can be fear at your doorstep saying you cannot do this. But you've got to just begin to say, no, no, I am doing this. And you step out and begin to say, I'm doing this because I'm working for the Lord and there's no better reward than that. I was so refreshed when I did leave. But there is something that we want to look at. Uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 21. Romans chapter 8 verse 21. We want to get right into the word here. And this is probably one of the biggest flaws. I'm going to pause just a little bit a second here because I want patients to hear this. This is really important. So, Amen. No, I just said I'm pausing because I want you to hear this. This is really important. So praise the Lord. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Okay? That wasn't just for you. It was for everybody, but I knew you were at the door. Um, there is therefore now no condemnation. You need to really, really, really saturate yourself in the love of God. If you want to move forward from fear and not allow fear to stop you and paralyze you and cripple you, because there are lots of opportunities for fear. It will give you, fear will give you visions. I mean, last night it suddenly got really cold, you know, and, and somebody said, look at how cold it is. It's minus 15, and right away the enemy sends me a picture and says, well, if your cow had a baby outside, it didn't do so well in the middle of the night, did it? Because I didn't check them in the middle of the night, right? And, of course, you go out there in the morning, and there's a little guy up there in the straw all dried off. He's already had a drink, and he's looking at me like, Sup? He's all good. You know why? Because God takes care of things. Amen? And so, but fear will try and visit you and give you pictures, and you can, you know, it's no different than when, when your kids get their, their license, and the enemy tries to send you a picture of a, a car accident or something. You know, there's always something that will try and stop you. And one of the areas that we're going to notice here about what really tries to stop us as believers, it says in chapter 8 of verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation. One of the greatest robbers of everybody is condemnation because mental illness and the stuff that you are fearful of is all rooted in shame or selfishness. And what that means is there is stuff that you may have went through or your family has went through. And what the enemy loves to do is he'll either bring in shame, go to, I can't talk about it, I can't pray about it. I can't go to the church and, and have them help me see this get fixed because it's a shameful thing. Or, 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 or you feel condemned like, you know, no one's going to want to talk to me. I'm just an old sinner. And my, by the way, all the things that I got wrong in my life, I should have been able to fix on my own, and I didn't. And because I didn't, now they're all going to just want to beat me up and really just kind of run the other way. And God says, there is therefore now no condemnation. You are not condemned. I, you can get made fun of as a Christian say, well, you're just a pastor that says you can just do whatever you want. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is because of Jesus, there's no condemnation. I'm not suggesting that there aren't better life choices that we can make. I, we all could make better life choices, right? 
you all can get into a bit of a conversation and go, oh man, my mouth got ahead of me, or I got carried away, or whatever. Those are all better life choices that you can do. The first thing you can do, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. So it starts with that choice, but it also says there is no condemnation. You think of that. There is therefore now no condemnation. We'll continue to pray for Alice, and she's family to us, so I'll name her, and if she's watching on YouTube, we all say hello. But, you know, we visited. We had a wonderful time. I did not want the enemy to bring in condemnation into her life and say, well, I can't come back to church because I've been away for so long. And you know, that, that's not how we operate, and that's not how the church is going to operate. But the devil operates that way. I remember when I joined the, joined the gym, I was good for a month, and I had that little checkoff list. Carl Allen, I was one of the first files. It's probably still there. But it's all checked off because I was there, and I was there, and I was there, and I, I got to go and watch how I was losing weight, and I was the fat guy on the treadmill and on the elliptical machine. It was kind of cool because the way it goes is you, you just kind of get your butt out there swinging, and away you go, right? But then I began to miss a day, and then two days, and then a week, and before long I thought, I can't go because it's going to be Judgment Alley. You walk in there and you smell the fresh um, whatever in the gym, I guess. Maybe it's sweat. And, and, and you go in there and they're all lined up and they're all going, da, 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 and you're supposed to walk past them all and wave, hey, I'm the fat guy that just came back. And I didn't want to do that because I was under condemnation. I was under condemnation because I said, I can't go back because I kind of failed at what I was going to do. And they're all going to judge me because after all, they're still there. They're still there. I can't come back to church because I missed too many services, but they're all still there. Or I can't do this because, you know, after all, you know, everybody else seems to be getting the jobs, but not me. Or, or the kids are good, but not me. Or the money's good, but not me. And condemnation begins to come in, and the enemy will just actually send you pictures and say, you don't deserve this because. And today I want to give you the antidote. This is kind of like your EpiPen for fear. Because you know what happens when you get stung? How many of you ever saw the movie with Martin Short? Um, oh, was it? Pure luck. Pure luck. It's the best. Anyone know the scene I'm talking about? I gotta, we're going to Google it later just to see it. Martin Short is a good little actor. And uh, he, in this area, he, he has the worst luck. I do not believe in luck. But for today, we're going to talk about this for just a brief moment. But this, him and this girl both had the worst kind of luck, and the only way they could ever find one another was to just let fate happen. And anyway, long story short, he's in an airplane, but one of the most major important things about his life is he cannot ever get stung by a bee. Because if he gets stung by a bee, he gets puffed up as wide as that table. So anyway, the funny thing is, of course, pure luck, he leans forward in the airplane and there's a bumblebee right on the back of his seat. And then you can see in the scene where he leans back into the thorn of the bumblebee and he gets stung. And he doesn't know, all he knows is, oh, and he kind of flips something off and doesn't think anything of it. He kind of waves to the pilot. And, and so time goes on and the next scene kind of flashes by and suddenly you see him and he's huge. And he doesn't know yet and he's like... And everyone's like, they don't know whether to tell him or not because he's huge. I mean, he's like, and suddenly you kind of can tell by everyone's reaction. And he looks in the mirror and he sees his face is all big and fat and more chins than a Chinese phone book. And he's like, oh, no. And he starts to panic. Well, the only way to fix him was to get the antidote, which was the EpiPen. And that would, you know, stab him in the leg or whatever. And, and, and so that would take the swelling down and then he would live. So it was quite a funny scene. <laughs> You'll have to Google it, but it's pretty good. But the point is, God's EpiPen for you is in Romans 8, verse 2. It says, uh, verse 1, sorry, through to 2. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free. That's your EpiPen moment. The law of the spirit of Christ Jesus has made me free. Didn't say might. Didn't say if you did enough good things. Didn't say if you get to church enough. Didn't say if you were the longest person at Bible study. Didn't say if you ate the most butter tarts. It said you have been made free. Period. So anytime fear comes at your door, or anytime condemnation comes at your door, the Bible says that, look at this. Now, it's not giving you license to do whatever you want. It says, for the law of the spirit of life, it's a spiritual law. 
It's a spiritual law. The spiritual law says that the cruise control in my car or natural law right now doesn't work. And so the other day when I was driving, I was driving. It wasn't much. It was like 103 kilometers an hour on the bypass by Caledonia. And I saw a cruiser coming and I looked down and I was speeding. And I usually, when my cruise control will work, I'll set it and then you never speed. You're good. I wasn't paying attention. I was talking to sand and probably, I don't know, it, it was talking about Talese or something. But anyway... I was talking, and I looked down, thought, oh my, and sure enough, she turned around, and she came back, and I said, you know what, I, I have no excuse, I'm sorry, I was doing that, and anyway, she was real good, I got a $25 fine, which wasn't great, but the bottom line was, I had broke that law, based on breaking that law, there was a payment to be made for breaking the law, okay, she was good. She could have been pretty bad because my license plate was all covered in salt. You couldn't even see the license number. And she said, can I wipe it off? I'm like, absolutely, go for it. You want to wipe the license plate off? You go for it. But she could have given me a ticket because it's covered up. I mean, you're supposed to have it seen, right? Anyway, $25 and away we went. But I broke the law. So natural law represented something having to be payment. Now, in your life, you can say, but Pastor, I've broken a natural law in many ways. And the enemy is telling me now I have to pay. I've broken a natural law, I've sinned, I've done wrong, I've, I've missed the mark. Well, we know that if we choose that the law of the spirit of life in Christ, if you're choosing to walk in the law of Christ, if you're choosing to walk in the life of Christ Jesus, you have been made free. You have been set free from the law of sin and death. So you say, well, pastor, I, the, the law of sin and death, I still sin, I still make mistakes, I still do wrong. I get that. The people that are truthful are the ones that are going to say, yeah, you're still doing some wrong. But the good news is that law is something that if you sow into the proper law, you will reap the proper harvest. You're, you're, you see, you don't just get born again and you're suddenly just all fixed. It's a life. You're getting fixed all the time. You are in recovery all the time. You are moving forward all the time. So it says here, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free. The Bible says who the Son has set free is free indeed. Think about that. So you say, well, let's be honest, we've got some situations in our church, whether people are needing jobs or they're needing their family sorted out or something. Maybe you need to start shouting out with your, the mouth, with your mouth that the spirit of the life of Christ has set my family free, has set my job free, has set my finances free, has set my healing free. You have been set free. He, Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, what is the law of sin and death?